Oftentimes we are given three points of a quadratic equation and we are asked to find the equation, to find the maximum or the minimum of the equation. And sometimes depending upon what we have to do, we have to answer additional questions, but most times we have to at least come up with what the equation is. So if we start out by thinking about the fact that any quadratic equation fits the model of ax squared plus bx plus c, we have three unknowns that we don't know. And in this case, we have three points. So we can use those three points to generate three equations with a, b, and c, and then solve that system. So our negative one, one, if I plug in um, negative one for y, and then plug, it, plug in one for x, that'll give me a plus b plus c. My next point, we'll say I have 17 equals, and then we'll have 16a plus 4b plus c. And then for my last point, 7 equals a minus b plus c. Now, you may or may not recall how to solve equations or systems of three variables, but essentially we have to eliminate one value two times, and then now we have an equation system with two variables, and then now we can go ahead and solve that. So the easiest variable to eliminate in these types of problems is always c. So I'm going to multiply this top equation by negative 1 and add those two, and that will give me um, 18 equals 17a plus 3b. And then now if I do the same thing with um, these bottom two equations, and I multiply this guy by negative 1 and add those two, that will give me 10 equals 15a um, plus 5b. And now at this point, now I'm down to a variable or a system with two variables, and I can go ahead and solve for a and b. And then once I get a and b, I can plug back in to solve for c. And I'm pretty confident we can solve a system here. Um, if you are looking for the solutions, um, our a value will be 2, b is negative 4, and c is 1. And then once we have that, we can write this as a function f of x equals 2x squared minus 4b plus 1. Now, there's going to be some times where we can actually avoid having to do this messy system. So let's take a look at this next problem. What I want you to observe here is that when I look at my points, two of them have the same y value. And because of that, that tells me something really important about my equation. We know that our parabolas are symmetrical. And because they're symmetrical, if we know two points with the same y, we can essentially graphically figure out where the vertex is located. So if we were to go ahead and sketch this out, we have points at negative 1, 6, and 3, 6. And like we talked about a little bit ago, we said that that axis of symmetry is going to be right in the middle of any two points on the graph. So if I were to draw, well, that's a really fat axis of symmetry. Let's make that a little bit smaller. So if I were to draw this in, there's my axis of symmetry. I know that my vertex is going to be somewhere along that line of x equaling 1. Now, if I plot my other point, my um, 1, 2, that's right here. And I can see based on this that my graph is facing up. And um, at first glance, it looks like my parabola is going to be like this. And so then what I would try doing is I'd say, okay, well, does this fit the model of up 1 over 1, up 3 over 1? And yep, it sure does. So now, with this being said, I know that my vertex is at 1, 2, and I can say that my equation has an a value of 1, and I have x minus 1 squared plus 2. And if I need this to be in standard form, I could real quick x squared minus 2x plus 1 plus 2. So f of x equals x squared minus 2x plus 3. All right, moving on. Composition of functions and inverses are the last two topics that we're going to go over. So first things first, this notation that we see here, um, f of g of x and this g of f of x, both of those notations mean the same thing. They both mean 
composition of functions, they mean you put one function inside the other. So let's do each of these just to kind of walk through those steps. So f of g means that I'm going to take the entire g equation and plug it in everywhere that I see x. So that would be like saying four times, and then I'm taking this entire equation for g, so x squared minus 2x plus 6, and then minus 1. So you'll notice here that this x is what I have replaced here. All of the rest of the equation is still there. And then now I just go ahead and distribute. So 4x squared minus 8x plus 24 minus 1. And then that'll give me my um, final equation. All right. Now, if we look at the other one, um, g of f of x, this one's just a little bit more complicated because here I am taking this equation, 4x minus 1, and I'm plugging it in everywhere I see x. And you want to make sure that you use parentheses. So I'm going to have 4x minus 1 quantity squared minus 2 times 4x minus 1 plus 6. So we can see here I've plugged in that variable everywhere that an x was, and then now it's just a matter of simplifying. So super common mistake people make is right here. We just write 16x squared plus 1. Eh, that's wrong. We have to make sure that we FOIL it out or use our perfect square trinomial rules. So we'll have 16x squared minus 8x plus 1 minus oops, 8x plus 2 and then plus 6. And then when we combine all our like terms, we get this equation here. All right, last but not least are inverse functions. So fundamentally, when you take a function and you find its inverse, that means you're going to be switching the x and y values and solving for y. That's how you find your inverse function. Um, in terms of our domain and our range, the domain of your original function um, becomes the range of your uh, inverse and your range becomes your inverse. So all of these x's and y's essentially switch. Well, the only way that a function can have an inverse is if that function is one-to-one, -one. Um, meaning that every x has one y and every y has one x. Well, the problem with parabolas is that the parabola does not pass the horizontal line test. Because if I were to take this graph, which right now fails the horizontal line test, and do the inverse of that, it's now going to fail the vertical line test and wouldn't be a function. So the only way that a quadratic function can have an inverse is if we limit the domain. And so this is a type of question that you might see in some cases. It might ask you what the domain of the inverse would be or what would be the smallest possible value. And in order to do that, you essentially have to find out where is your vertex. And then once you know your vertex, you're either going to limit it to the right half of the graph or the left half of the graph. And that's more um, dependent upon the problem. So uh, I just wanted to mention that because I, I know I've seen that in a few problems where it talks about the restricted domain. All right, that's it. Good luck.